Good morning, I'm Kathleen Plummer, and on behalf of the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration at the George Washington University, I welcome you to our first of 2017 uh, Grants Management Breakfasts. And it's, it's a pleasure with our EI systems and our school to convene sessions where people involved in grants management from across the federal government, both in this room and also on the phone, uh, listening in, uh, can talk about uh, and share ideas and promising practices with grants management. We think grants management is important and deserves attention, and we're, we've been delighted to provide great forums with some really fantastic speakers. Um, the Trachtenberg School has students working, uh, grad, uh, alumni working all over uh, the federal government. We've had the Masters of Public Administration since 1963, so we have quite a few folks uh, around. And we provide a lot of different kinds of policy forums, and this is one. We have um, Admiral Thad Allen's going to speak at our um, Ad Admiral Thad W. Allen Public Service Leadership Forum on March 8th at 6 o'clock across the street. Uh, for our next one. So I'm ex very excited today because one of our alums who I actually taught when he was in our MBA program is going to speak. But that's not what we told picked up. That was, that was totally coincidental, seriously. Anyway, so I'm going to uh, hand this off to Jeff. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, my name is Jeff Myers. I'm from REI Systems. And we looked around, frankly, and, and have been involved in grants management for a while. And we said, well, is there, where's the community? Where are the folks who are interested in grant making? And it turned out that almost all the folks who talked about grants were about, how can I receive more grants? And to some extent, how can I make sure I don't make a misstep and uh, found, be found on compliant and lose my grant money? Um, but frankly, the federal government puts out more than 20% of its spending by grants, and that seems, with this administration, likely, if anything, to, to increase in terms of a proportion. And so the ability to make grants effectively and in ways that have integrity and in ways that achieve agency mission outcomes is really important. So we want to try and create a community where folks had a chance to exchange ideas with each other and form networks and solve problems that are facing real agency grant makers today. Uh, and that's what this is, frankly. We try to identify a variety of different topics, a variety of different speakers and agencies to come and help promote that community. Um, in terms of REI systems, let me just give you a very quick background. We have about 500 people. We heavily focus on grant making in the federal government, as well as transparency, uh, system development, and advisory services. Uh, the most recent activities that might interest you are that we actually now support enterprise-wide both grant receiving and grant making for the states of Ohio and Rhode Island and Minnesota. So in addition to our federal uh, agency clients, such as the Health Resources and Services Administration, NASA, Small Business Administration, uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, we're working as well in integrating some of the federal grant making activities with systems at the state level to promote accountability and efficiency. Um, so let's leave uh, r and for a moment though and talk about our speaker. Uh, our speaker is Stan Dumont. He is the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Grants at HUD, and he oversees the Community Development Block Grant Program as well as several others. I was frankly astounded because, unlike me and I suspect many of you, he has overseen the disbursement and grants of more than $60 billion over the course of his career. So he's got a lot of experience, and it's not just experience, actually, Stan, it has been recognized with the Presidential Rank Award for Meritorious Service in 2015, so he's one of the best recognized, most effective executives in government, which I think deserves our thanks to stand for his public service, in addition to speaking here this morning. And as Kathy mentioned, Stan received his uh, both undergraduate and graduate degrees here from the George Washington University, uh, so he's a local boy. Um, I asked him, well, Stan, well, are there some, some things you did that kind of were before your 30 years of experience with HUD? And he said, I pretty much kind of came straight from George Washington University to HUD. So what we'd like to do is uh, turn him over to Stan. He's indicated to me that he might like kind of five minutes to give you a little bit of a lay of the land with his presentation to start with. But after that, 
invites your questions as he goes. And I do hope that you'll have some questions for him. We find that during these forums, a lot of the interesting discussion happens during the questions from the audience and actually members of the audience speaking and asking questions of each other occasionally as well as uh, of the speaker. Uh, the last thing that I would point out is that we have an audience, uh, perhaps as many as 50 folks listening on the uh, live, uh, live stream on the internet, as well as the folks in the room. So we'll do our best to try and get a microphone to whoever is asking a question or answering a question so that the folks who are online can hear as well. Uh, Stan, thank you for coming. experiences at HUD and uh, so we've entitled this particular session this morning uh, lessons at, and successes at HUD how to support communities uh, so the, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development is a cabinet level agency with a FY 2016 budget of approximately 48 billion dollars across a number of uh, different programs uh, the major external facing components of the agency uh, in alphabetical order, so as not to uh, slight any of my colleagues, uh, the Office of Community Planning and Development, which, uh, which I represent, uh, the uh, Federal Housing Administration, the Office of Housing, which runs the FHA single family and multi family programs, our Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, which addresses uh, fair housing and non discrimination laws as well as our Office of Public and Indian Housing, which handles uh, public housing, Section 8 programs, and, and uh, a number of other uh, initiatives that provide housing across the country. The bottom line is that uh, the funds that move through HUD on an annual basis touch every community across the country every year. Uh, it is, uh, you know, look at it from, from FHA mortgage insurance to the provision of Section 8 vouchers to house individuals, to the provision of community development funding and homeless assistance. Uh, again, we're touching every community across the country, so uh, the way in which we, we look at managing those dollars is very important and has a lot of impact uh, nationwide. <coughs> our focus today is gonna be uh, talking about some of our technical assistance efforts over the years, and uh, what we wanna focus on is how we provide communities with the skills, the knowledge, the tools, the capacity, and systems to successfully implement these programs. And uh, we do that in a variety of ways. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, the experience that I've had over, over the years with regard to technical assistance, uh, particularly from uh, the standpoint of the Office of Community Planning and Development. Um, CPD um, is the uh, HUD component that has the most direct contact with local and state officials as well as nonprofit organizations that provide homeless assistance uh, 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 throughout, uh, throughout the country. The key programs we work with, um, I've got the, uh, the, the letter salad there for you, uh, the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, which is really uh, one of the original block grants uh, going back to the 1970s. The Home Investment Partnership Program, which is an affordable housing production program, and our SNAPS program, Special Needs Assistance Program, which, uh, which encompasses our homeless uh, assistance efforts. Overall, in 2016, that, that, those programs account for about $6 billion in the department's budget. Um, when we think about providing assistance to, to uh, uh, the recipients of those funds, um, I want to turn the clock back a few years and, and talk about where we were back uh, approximately 10 years ago. Uh, we had sort of non-uniform -uni funding for technical assistance efforts. Uh, some of the programs had uh, embedded uh, within their statutes uh, a way to take some money off of the table uh, for technical assistance purposes. That was particularly true of the HOME program and to a degree with regard to the SNAPS program. For the CDBG program, um, it was kind of catch as catch can. When Congress decided to appropriate money for the purpose, that's when we received money. Um, and uh, it wasn't constant, it wasn't every year, and the, the amounts fluctuated. So it was very difficult to establish uh, a coherent year-to-year -year process with regard to uh, 
technical assistance funding. Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, dispersion with regard to management of those funds. Each different program was going off in its own track about how best to implement uh, technical assistance for communities. Uh, and uh, one of the things you found ultimately was there was a real heavy reliance on, on a classroom style approach to providing that assistance. So those grantees would love to come for three days and sit in a room somewhere and, uh, and, and take it all in. One of the things they really valued in that, that particular scenario was the ability to be face to face in some cases with a HUD official who could answer some questions for them. But more or less, the, the sessions were being run by our technical assistance providers and uh, for that, that purpose, for that reason. Uh, we really couldn't have a lot of our staff on site for some of the, the, these events. Uh, looking a little bit more broadly across the agency, uh, there was no coordination really between what CPD was doing versus what our colleagues in public housing were doing versus what our colleagues in fair housing were doing. And so the idea would be, um, how can you better, better coordinate all of this? So this whole situation was really ripe for change as we, we look back uh, about 2007, 2008, 2009. One of the things that really began to change the course for us um, in 2008, as we move into 2009, 2010, was the uh, uh, establishment of what was known as the Neighborhood Stabilization <coughs> Program. So as we, um, as the nation faced the housing crisis 2008, 2009, one of the steps Congress took was to begin to appropriate money uh, to HUD for the purpose of assisting communities in addressing the effects of abandoned and foreclosed housing across the country. And in three separate appropriations, 2008 through uh, 2010, Congress appropriated $7 billion in total for that purpose. We were able to take $70 million out of that, that uh, funding stream for the purpose of providing technical assistance to our grantees across the country, which were primarily states and local governments, but also to a degree uh, nonprofit organizations. And uh, we, we ended up with a, uh, a universe of about 400 grantees nationwide, if I, if I recall the numbers correctly. Uh, and what they were faced with was implementing in a very, very quick manner a program which they really didn't have a capacity to run. Because what this was was a real estate-based program. This is talking about state and local government going uh, into communities, into targeted neighborhoods, uh, where we could identify that there was distress on the basis of uh, uh, foreclosed property, abandoned property, uh, and then going in and addressing those properties. In some cases, buying them uh, and rehabilitating them for resale. In some cases, going in and buying them and then demolishing them. Uh, in some cases, establishing financing mechanisms to assist individuals in buying those properties and, and returning them to productive use. Because our, our local government <coughs> partners really didn't have a lot of expertise in this particular area, what we tried to do through our technical assistance effort was to stand this program up and stand it up quickly. And so we, uh, in 2009, began to uh, work with our technical assistance providers after running a competition to secure them. Uh, we, we worked with those providers to get out there on the ground and we did a variety of things uh, in 2009, 10, 11, 12, and, and really to an extent some, some of that work continues to this day uh, to focus on uh, uh, how they can best use these dollars. We provided direct technical assistance by going into uh, communities and saying, okay, these are the things you need to do from a policy and procedure standpoint about in order to make this program run. Uh, there was a set of continual webinars, I think where the number ultimately approached about 200 over a, a course of several years. Problem solving clinics where we would have our technical assistance providers and our staff show up uh, at uh, various sites across the country and for, for a day or two days uh, literally have round tables that you, uh, the local government partners could go from table to table to table to get their answer, questions answered uh, with regard to issues they were facing in implementation of the program. And then we developed an online resource exchange, uh, including an ask a question portal, uh, where we endeavored to try and get uh, uh, responses to individuals within about 48 to 72 hours. Um, this was pretty effective uh, because it was under tight, uh, tight expenditure deadlines and uh, virtually every grantee met those deadlines. Uh, on that $7 billion investment, our grantees have returned uh, to themselves really for, for reuse for the same purpose 
approximately $1.5 billion over time. It wasn't mandatory that they do that, but many grantees set up their programs such that they would have this recurring revenue stream. Uh, our uh, effort to manage the uh, uh, technical assistance effort was, was really a very hands-on effort. Uh, uh, one of my predecessors in the, in the job I occupy at this point in time, she, uh, she was very hands-on. Uh, two, two meetings a week, an hour every session, going over where we are on uh, these technical assistance engagements with our grantees. Um, and what that, that tells us ultimately is that if you're going to have a successful program of this nature, you really have to be paying attention to it on a day-in, day-out basis in order to, to uh, manage not only um, the HUD internal staff, but to oversee and uh, have good control over what your technical assistance providers are doing. Um, a little graphic uh, kind of shows a bit of a timeline moving from you know pre-2010 uh, uh, through uh, uh, into uh, 2010 where we begin to establish a one CPD concept for technical assistance building on many of the lessons learned early in the NSP process and then ultimately moving towards a, uh, a more department-wide effort on uh, technical assistance in the uh, in more recent years. And the uh, subsequent slides are going to follow through on the, uh, the timeline that I've got here. Um, again, prior to 2008 or so, very dispersed uh, uh, management and oversight of, of this technical assistance effort. Um, assistant secretary we had in, in office at that time decided to take charge of this, consolidated much of uh, uh, much of our technical assistance effort um, to increase uh, the base of providers that we used was one of the goals here because uh, everybody kind of got in a bit of a rut. You, had, you saw a number of different providers that, that were, got recurred every time we were going out for a particular uh, 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 solicitation or, or notice of funding availability. And so we were trying to broaden the base to bring more uh, organizations and different uh, types of expertise to bear for our grantees. Um, we instituted a structured decision-making process. And in, that, in essence, this brought uh, uh, control back to uh, the HUD headquarters staff as opposed to leaving it out in the field. That was a difficult transition for some of our field staff in that uh, they had been used to kind of controlling this. but. Again, what we were finding is that they were not always in fully engaged in managing those dollars. Dollars were left on the table in some cases, and um, many of the, the uh, uh, efforts that were uh, instituted by uh, or authorized by our field staff were not necessarily effective. So in order to make sure that this became a more effective vehicle, we centralized the control and had this uh, structured dis decision-making process. Um, Three approaches to help. The grantee could, could seek the help on their own. Our field staff could call that help in, or from a <coughs> uh, headquarters perspective, we could decide this situation warrants intervention, and we are going to be happy to provide that intervention uh, in order to help, uh, help the grantee achieve um, a set of overall goals. Again, uh, one work in this particular situation as we move from uh, uh, the, the sort of dispersed nature of our, our effort. Uh, to a more centralized process. Uh, again, aggressive deployment, uh, where we have a strong identity of interest between HUD and recipient. Um, and we can point to a number of different situations where we had good positive outcomes. Um, looking into the NSP context, um, working, our work with Cook County, Illinois, was really very, uh, uh, very rewarding in the sense that uh, we were able to help transform not only their NSP program, but their underlying community development structure for, uh, uh, for the county, uh, working on policies, procedures, uh, uh, program structure, uh, just ensuring that uh, they had all the tools that they needed to have in place and properly functioning in order to administer the dollars that were coming to them. Um, Jeff. If it's fair to start asking questions, I'm curious, you've got the three different approaches, grantee initiated CPD staff, kind of on behalf of colleagues at GW. Did you ever do any random assignment and say, okay, well in Des Moines, we're gonna initiate just because, because they were randomly selected and maybe in Dubuque, uh, we're not going to, or, or kind of use any other sort of, again, randomization to kind of compare which works better? We would always, there's gotta be some issue we wanna try and get at. And, and, and 
in some cases, you would look for a pool of willing folks. I mean, there, that's a very important one in the piece of this puzzle uh, as well when, when you're looking at what's effective. There's got to be a willingness out there uh, to take that, that assistance, that help, and, and, and make it useful. Uh, situations where you go in and there's a resistance to that help, that's, that's a recipe for a problem. And so what we're really looking for is where we have this uh, uh, commonality of interest, where we can, we can make something, uh, something work, we can improve the process, we can uh, improve the outcomes at the end of the day. Um, you know, there can be some, self, you know, some selection on the part of HUD that way, but again, you can't force folks to the table. You've got to bring them along and, and make them understand how this effort is, in fact, in their best interest. Can I ask you to go, uh, going to sort of leveraging off that and clay, if you could clarify when you're saying centralize, are you centralizing within CPD or are you centralizing within <coughs> HUD for enterprise wide? That's my first question because I want to <coughs> clarify how you're doing that. Okay, and first the second, let me ask that's easy. At okay. this point, it's CPD. Okay. At this point, it's only CPD. <coughs> and then when you're talking about bringing them to the table and the difficulty with that part, are you talking? These are direct grantees, or is this going through the state in terms of one of the block grant funds? I mean, you're having, you having difficulty bringing direct grantees to the table? In some cases, the, there's, a, there's a question. Okay. Um, so the first question was, um, uh, when I'm, I'm, with regard to this particular slide, the discussion is, is CPD only, not HUD? Why? We're going to, again, we're going to move towards that direction okay. a bit further on in the discussion. Uh, uh, as far as uh, the, in, the ability to bring folks to the table, um, there's got, again, there's got to be a willingness out there. There's a, there are 101 ways for people to resist the, the, the assistance you're trying to provide them. Uh, and so you've got to have a working relationship. It can't be you will do this and you will do that. Uh, there's got to be, um, uh, uh, given the, the degree to which we're working with elected officials, we're not in a position of necessarily telling them that we must, uh, you must take this help. We need to sell that to them as it's going to be an improvement on your process. Um, so I wanted to go back um, to the slide before where you mentioned that you received $70 million over the course of, of that period. And the communities were able to leverage 1.5 billion, correct? That's correct. Okay, so were they straight grant programs? Yes. Okay. So the, the, the way neighborhood stabilization worked, there was a, a uh, grant program through state or local government, and in one round we were able to include nonprofit organizations. And so what they would do is go out and use those funds in targeted neighborhoods that have particular issues with regard to foreclosed or abandoned property. Mm -hmm. Uh, they could structure the program as they liked. Uh, again, different problems in different parts of the country, different approaches worked in, in, in different places. But in some places, it was uh, very useful for them to buy property up, to rehabilitate that property, and turn around and sell it. And as that revenue returns back to the, to the grantee, they then are required to use that for the same set of activities. Uh, and so that, that, for our purposes, we call that program income. And so as you keep recycling that money, you keep using it under the uh, auspices of the original program. So then, when does it lose the federal character? At the end of the uh, Somewhere subsequent to close out. So okay. we will eventually close these grants out. And uh, actually, I think what we're going to do is turn it into the City Community Development Block Grant Program <coughs> because the whole NSP structure was built on the CDBG program. Congress said in enacting it, treat these dollars as if they're CDBG unless we tell you otherwise. Question in the room. Did you start immediately with 400 grantees or did you, how did you scale up? The reason I ask is I run a program that's over 2,000 grantees. Mm -hmm. um, that's also on the discretionary side. And the problem we have is when we get TA, we only do a small portion. So how did you scale up? I mean, 400 is a lot less than 2,000, but how did you scale up to there to be able to support 400? Um, the initial appropriation was, was just about $4 billion, and it was uh, always instructed uh, by the statute to come up with a formula. It, the statute specified what the criteria were, were, and we developed a formula based on that criteria and allocated to uh, uh, states and local governments across the country uh, with a minimum grant floor in there of $2 million, if I recall correctly. And so that 
us about 305, 310 grantees in, in the first round. And then in the subsequent rounds, we added other grantees moving upwards towards that 400 number. But in some of the, uh, you know, we had a number of repeat grantees that got money across all three rounds. And on the PA side, the PA contractor knew how to scale up, give that initial support to the newer grantees? Well, we, we received uh, $50 million with the initial slug of money for, for technical assistance purposes in 2009. It came out of the Recovery Act. Uh, we ran a quick competition to secure our providers got them on the ground, got them running late in, you know, in the latter part of 2009 to support the effort going forward. Uh, we received an additional $20 million out of uh, uh, an appropriation of a, of a billion dollars uh, that came through in the Dodd-Frank legislation. And so we added that money to the, to the process. I couldn't help but notice that the $70 million for technical assistance and $7 billion of grants was a very neat 1%. Was that by design or was that just kind of happenstance? Chance. Okay. <laughs> it, it was not 1%, although we have advocated in the past for, for amounts on that order, but uh, that just happened to be a, a, a random outcome. We could have actually used more, but Frank, we, we could have taken more under the statute, but the reality is I don't think we could have used any more. There, there's, a limited capacity out there. Um, so with that, let me move on to kind of where we are today. Uh, and this gets more to the HUD-wide question that you would ask. So um, subsequent to NSP, subsequent to the experience with uh, one CPD, uh, our secretary at that time, uh, Sean Donovan, uh, who ultimately became the, the director of the Office of Management and Budget, wanted to move to a uh, uh, a TA effort that encompassed the entirety of the agency, and uh, we moved in that direction over seven years, uh, ultimately resulting in what we now call community compass. So we've kind of abandoned our one CPD approach uh, in favor of this this community compass approach that that cuts across all the various uh, programmatic cylinders that I, just, I described earlier or mentioned earlier. Um, <coughs> So what we've tried to do here is uh, come up with an integrated technical assistance and capacity building initiative, uh, rather than having each <coughs> different piece of the department go their own route in securing TA providers. Uh, we have centralized this into a single notice of funding availability, uh, and we run that, that process. Uh, the internal coordination and effort is run by our Office of uh, Policy Development and Research, uh, and uh, the sort of day-to-day -day management of the entire process is run by the technical assi technical assistance division within the Office of Community Planning and Development. So, uh, uh, the director is here, Stephanie Stone, uh, also another GW grad, so uh, it's, a, it's a popular place. <laughs> uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, we, we have moved in this direction over the last several years, uh, and uh, slowly kind of getting off the ground with regard to exactly how the various pieces work within the agency. Um, how do we come up with our, our internal uh, uh, process? Uh, how do we put our plan together? Uh, so our policy development and research office gets the proposals or the asks from, from each one of the operating portions of the building. Uh, we, we identify those priorities. We meet to discuss those priorities. Uh, we get the, the request set and then we finalize the plan which then uh, has to be approved by the Hill before we, uh, before we can actually go and implement that plan. So there are, again, a lot of coordination going on within the building uh, overall with respect to uh, how this funding is going to be used and, and put out on the street as we go forward. Um, so what we see is the opportunities in this model. Uh, May I ask? In justifying the technical assistance to Congress, I can imagine you might say, we need to provide this in order to minimize risk. These housing agencies won't understand what the requirements are and they might fall out of compliance if we don't provide TA. Or you might say, you know, we've got a few low performing housing agencies in some parts of the country. We really need to give them technical assistance to improve performance. What do you think have been the kind of the most persuasive arguments for technical assistance in either budget discussions or, or authorizing discussions or what have you? Clearly, um, there's a recognition uh, that there needs to be some level of help 
uh, for the grantees that you have received the dollars on a year in year out basis. Um, you know, HUD staffing levels have kind of been going down over time. I mean, we're down down to about 7,500 people at the agency, so we don't have the where, internal wherewithal that we once had to provide the kind of training and hands-on oversight you know, uh, that might have occurred in, in decades past. Um, and clearly there is a value in bringing in outside uh, parties to uh, you know, uh, help uh, educate and deal with uh, some of the uh, difficulties that our grantees face. And uh, when we go to the Hill to talk about that, it is, uh, you know, sold to them, frankly, as a, uh, you know, this is a must do um, in order to be able to uh, adequately support the various programs that we run. Uh, we try not to overstate the case. Uh, part of the challenge that we face in questioning from the Hill is, well, what are the results? What are, what are you getting out of this? And again, we can we can point to any of a number of different scenarios where we've gotten a good return and a good on the investment that we've made. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we sometimes struggle in trying to get all the dollars on the street and out the door. Notwithstanding there's a lot of competition for the money, actually it's kind of squeezing it out of the pipeline and, and getting that help out there is a you know sometimes a challenge. So if you could incorporate into your comments, how are you, as, as you say, I mean, you're providing technical assistance, and again, I don't know HUD terminology, but for the other agencies that I work with, you know, are, I'm not sure if we're talking program or administrative, or that includes both. But how are you using the results of the single audit and now with the new uniform guidance, looking at the new uh, risk uh, assessments that have to be done for grantees, especially for recurring grantees, and the rise of findings um, from the single audits from grantees across the federal government. How are you using that to apply your compass model? Or maybe you're going to be coming to that later on. Um, at this point, I, I don't have a great answer for that particular that, that particular question. Um, uh, we are kind of slowly feeling our way along on the implementation of uh, many of the requirements under the uniform administrative requirements. Um, you know, I was just talking with Kathy a little bit earlier uh, this morning about the, the challenges in doing that and trying to make sure that all the underlying uh, structures that our grantees have, all their documentation things, adequately reflect uh, uh, those, uh, those revised requirements. And I think it's going to be a long time before we get everybody squared up to uh, actually have uh, accommodated and incorporated the requirements under the uniform guidance. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we're, we're always cognizant of, of the issues that are arising out of the Single Audit Act uh, uh, results. Um, I would also say that from the, uh, from the HUD standpoint, we have an exceptionally uh, active Inspector General's office. Uh, who, uh, we we uh, made a lot of attention. Um, and, um, that is a, a kind of a, an additional check that we look at with respect to uh, the provision of uh, a lot of our technical assistance. And in many ways, uh, I think that's a, a more of a driver of, of uh, some of the things that we do with technical assistance than, than the single audit act outcomes. <coughs> um, Again, returning to uh, some of the opportunities we have here, uh, cross-cutting approaches, we have a number of different initiatives within the department that require uh, fairly close collaboration across the various uh, parts of the department. Uh, and uh, the community compass model gives us that ability to integrate that assistance in a better way. Uh, more and more, we are turning to a place-based strategy with regard to um, uh, implementation of our program. I'll we'll talk about that a bit more uh, further on. Uh, the single NOFA competition again reduces work internally uh, as you're facing uh, decreasing staff. That's an important consideration. Uh, and uh, we believe that ultimately this allows us to get funds obligated faster, which means that we can be out there on the street assisting communities and grants <coughs> in a uh, more rapid fashion. Um, um, so by having one competition, I'm, I'm curious to know whether you have different statutes uh, where you receive funding uh, towards TA, and if if that, how you consolidate that with one NOFA? Sure. 
sure. Uh, the, for the folks online, the question is, do we have different statutes that affect the, the, the technical assistance funding and how do we manage that? Um, the first thing to understand with HUD is we work in a very unique environment when it comes to competitive programs. There is something known as the HUD Reform Act of 1989. Uh, for those of us you know, able to remember the 1980s, the number of scandals at, uh, at HUD, uh, and Congress put in place uh, uh, the HUD Reform Act in order to kind of standardize uh, the approach to the competitive award of, uh, one of the aspects of the act addressed competitive award of funds. And so we worked in, in a very different environment than a lot of other agencies with respect to how we do this and how public we are. And, and what we can say and what we can't say to applicants as they come in the door to apply for those dollars. And that certainly applies to our TA funds. Uh, the TA funding that we do receive um, comes via uh, a couple of different sources. I mean, there, is a, uh, there has been an appropriation over the last several years for, for the distinct purpose uh, of, of uh, community compass and, and the, uh, the, the broader effort. But we still have other streams of money, particularly on our, our special needs and homeless assistance programs, where they're getting dollars that they actually attach to this, this single <coughs> movement, but they run on somewhat of a, a, a parallel track. Uh, and I don't recall if there are any other instances within the department of that nature, but I know for sure that the SNAP funding for technical assistance, you know, again, we, we link them up, but they run, they run parallel. Um, it, it's a bit of a challenge sometimes to make sure that you are able to uh, work with uh, the various uh, uh, types of groups that are uh, grantees under the various programs to make sure that you've got them all covered under the umbrella of the assistance you intend to provide. So um, Anytime, as far as constraints are concerned in the community compass model, uh, anytime you have more people in the room, it gets a little bit more difficult to get the consensus about exactly how you're going to do things. Uh, but uh, I think that all in all, the, the effort has been pretty collegial within the department. There's always a bit of a tug of war for uh, who gets what, how much money out of the bucket for, uh, uh, for their particular initiatives. But uh, all in all, uh, I think we've, we've uh, managed this process pretty well. Uh, we do have staffing and resource limits internally to uh, oversee and manage the process. Um, the uh, multi-award programs don't necessarily fit all the models and, and programs within HUD. And, and again, there are these, these, particularly with, let's say, the SNAP programs that, that are running on somewhat of a separate track. Um, and that, that ultimately a decision of Congress not to consolidate uh, in a, in a a single amount for all TA efforts, so uh, not necessarily within the control of the department to make those things uh, all, all run alike. Um, we, um, we do see as a result that there's fewer dollars for individual programs where uh, one example would be under our home investment program. Um, you know, historically they had a bit of a, a takeoff uh, on the top of their appropriation for technical assistance purposes. That's kind of gone in this uh, in this more homogenized process. Uh, so we can point to a number of different instances where programs actually have slightly less available to them than they would have had under one of our older approaches. And uh, inevitably, there's always a desire to refine the process of so constant uh, uh, tinkering with systems and processes can be a, uh, uh, something that slows you down. Uh, if you have some consensus with regard to uh, how you're going to change something that's helpful, but if you have uh, uh, you know, different points of view on, on how you're going to change the process on a year-in, year-out basis, that, that can slow down the delivery of, of, of the dollars to your technical assistance providers and ultimately to your, uh, to your grantees. So it seems like you're kind of in a leading edge here of, of consolidating technical assistance across offices and grants and programs. And perhaps it's attractive maybe to grantees because instead of having two or three different folks come and visit them, they've kind of got one. And perhaps it's more efficient as well, but you know, maybe the one person who comes to visit them doesn't know each of the programs quite so well. So on balance, would you suggest other agencies might want to consider this model that HUD has done? What do you think overall? Um, from HUD's standpoint, again, if you're in a situation where your resources are, are, uh, are shrinking a bit, 
uh, you're going to have to think about consolidating uh, these kinds of efforts because uh, we're all kind of strapped for for uh, for the bodies and people and the knowledge to uh, effectively implement this. And if you, you have the same thing occurring in multiple places in a given department, that is not an efficient way in this scenario to, to get that work done. So from, from my standpoint, uh, it would seem to me that there's a there needs to be a movement in a number of different places to consolidating this sort of effort. So if, if we spoke the dirty word, that sounds kind of like a shared service. How did the various offices in HUD kind of take to this? Well, it's funny you might mention that because there was discussion of this several years ago about uh, the idea of trying to, to offer uh, the HUD community compass model as a bit of a shared service, and that didn't really get off the ground. To other departments? Yes. Um, so it was a bit of an internal discussion. I'm trying to remember if we had an extensive discussion with OMB on that, but uh, it, it really didn't lift off. Question. Do you have any tiered evidence grants under this model? Uh, I don't believe so, Stephanie. Stephanie's shaking her head. The answer would be no. <laughs> As I noticed that you had data analysis reporting and performance measurement, but you didn't have evaluation. Uh, so for, for the folks online, that the question is, do we have any tiered evidence grants under under this model? And the answer is no. There was a question all the way in the back. Uh, uh, so you see, perceive. Or can you actually measure any changes on the ground, whether it is because, or, or just lessons that you're learning in terms of uh, foreclosure, the neighborhood stabilization, or even improper payment changes or things like that? So that's been one of the great challenges, and I've got that on the slide a little bit later on, but you know, it's always a challenge to understand exactly what you're getting as far as the, the, the return on this investment. And uh, it has been, we can point to a number of, of specific situations where, where this, this type of help has had great, great return. Uh, and really has set a grantee on a better path or has addressed a particular problem that they face. Um, so that's kind of anecdotal. It, it, but trying to understand exactly what the needs are out there at the, at the local level in order to make this effective. Um, you know, the, the needs are so diverse. Uh, it's kind of like the problem we face with the Community Development Block Grant Program, which is how do you measure it? I mean, there's so many different outcomes here um, uh, and, and, and outputs that uh, it, it can sometimes be difficult to understand exactly what the value is. Um, one of the challenges we face out there at the local level is, uh, is, a, is a loss of expertise, particularly as we came out of the um, out of the recession in 2009, 2010, 2011, a lot of local governments and state governments scaled down their staffing. A lot of people were lost. We now see a bit more of a revolving door at a local level. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is, in, in the face of that particular problem, is establish uh, more effective policies and procedures that are going to outlive any individual. Uh, that lives probably not the best word, but uh, be there after they, they, uh, they leave the, their current position. Uh, because one of the things you, we found is everybody kind of goes back to square one. Um, and uh, when, when one or two key people leave at, at, at many local government level, many local government agencies. Uh, and so if you can give them uh, uh, you know, this structure, that's going to, going to be there regardless of who the individuals are running it, that, that's a real value added. Uh, because again, there is, we're just seeing a, a, a lot of constant value out there at the state and local level. And I just do a related follow-up. If you see a, something that is working, how does your TA system um, share that knowledge to help the rest of the TA system? That's one of the things we're trying to reel in and do better with, is rather than, than, than paying for the same wheel over and over and over. Uh, is making sure that our TA providers understand what we've already paid for and making sure there's a library available to them <coughs> and resources uh, are, are effectively cataloged and that, that they can be then, you know, extracted and, and applied where necessary. Uh, and, and again, getting that same, uh, getting multiple impacts for the dollars you're putting on the street as opposed to paying each time out, which was one of the problems you faced under uh, a, a non-coordinated effort, you know, from a decade ago. Decade ago. 
so we want to want our TA providers to be using the things we've already paid for and delivering them and delivering them in an effective manner. That, uh, well, actually, I was going to ask how you monitor and evaluate the quality of the TAs. I mean, I imagine it must vary across from you know Lincoln, Nebraska to you know Charlotte or whatever. That 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 how how do you feel that you that you sort of accomplished a quality assessment or monitoring over your TAs? Um, first and foremost, we rely on grantee feedback. Do they feel this has been valuable? So you have a systematic way to collect that all the time? There's a survey process that, that we're looking at from, from grantees. We want them to respond and tell us what, what they got out of this. Did this meet your needs? Uh, if it didn't, uh, what, what might help uh, focus that effort uh, going forward? So that's certainly part of the process. Um, we do our own internal evaluations in order to control of the uh, on the front end with regard to work plans. Exactly what are they going to do when they get out there? It's not necessarily left to uh, the provider to make a lot of decisions here. They're going to do the work, but it, again, we're going to define in the work plan. The better that work plan is on the front end, uh, we think the better the result we're going to get on the back end. So it's a, it's a front end management issue. Um, but again, Given it, that it's kind of difficult to understand exactly what you get at the end of the day, it, and it may not always be immediate, it, it's, 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 you're going to see the impact over several years as they administer the program. So uh, we've got to figure out a better way to get that result over a period of time and understand what that result is. Can I follow on to Shelley's question? Do you ever kind of proactively provide specific TA? And let me give an example. Do you ever say, based on the information we have coming in from, let's say, this, this housing agency in Chicago, it's got a compliance risk here or a performance problem there. They're a low performer. And the best practice that has resolved that particular low <coughs> performance issue the last three times was this particular best practice. Let us send out our TA team and tell them to go help Chicago try X and Y, because that's always resolved that problem in the past. Do you ever go up proactively to, to offer? Uh, we do. And uh, I think that the uh, most notable situation where we do that is in our disaster recovery, disaster recovery efforts. So Congress has appropriated a lot of money over a period of time to the CDBG program for purposes of long-term disaster recovery. These are supplemental grants uh, or supplemental funds, and then we then grant that to states and local governments. Um, the reality is when we do this, the amount of money that flows to, uh, to a grantee is, is oftentimes a, a multiple of what they realize in a, in a given year under our regular programs. Uh, an immediate example is uh, Hurricane Matthew uh, you know, hit the East Coast in uh, early October last fall. Congress, uh, in response, appropriated $1.8 billion in December for the purpose as well as some other, other uh, major disasters in 20, uh, uh, 2016. And we've allocated that money. State of North Carolina received almost $200 million under that, uh, under that uh, appropriation. And State of North Carolina, on a year-in, year-out basis under our CWG program, gets about 25 to $30 million. So now you've got 200 million. You're, you're in multiple six to seven times your, your annual program. And the annual program is still running. You can't just strip that in order to run this. And even if you do, you don't have enough people to do it. So we have now, over the, over the last several iterations of these supplemental appropriations, we've gone out there proactively, talk to these grantees and tell them, we're going to provide you with technical assistance to tell you how to scale up to address this money because we've learned that you just can't leave them to their own devices. They're going to try and do it on a small scale, um, and that's going to create a problem for not only for, for HUD, for the grantee, <coughs> but it creates a problem for the individuals who need the assistance at the end of the day whose houses don't get rehabilitated in a timely way. And so what we're trying to do with that proactive approach is get out there and tell them this is how this works, this is what you need to do, this is how you're going to have the staff up.
So generally thinking about the things that we do do under uh, community compass, needs assessments, uh, figuring out uh, exactly what it is that a, a community needs uh, via uh, our technical assistance effort. Uh, we do these direct technical assistance engagements where we put the providers on the ground for some period of time to help them uh, work through their issues uh, and, uh, and build capacity at the local level. Uh, again, we're going to develop and maintain these tools and products that we pay for so that we can we get continued occurring use out of, out of the investment. Um, Self-directed and, and group learning, we, we are turning more and more to using uh, uh, kind of short bite pieces on uh, available through our, our website with regard to training on various issues so that uh, 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 our grantees can pull that up as they get new staff coming in the door that they can they can pull these pieces up and, and begin to educate the staff that's coming in the door got to tell you there's still a great love out there on the ground for it you know group learning uh, in the classroom setting they just love that uh, you, you can't shake people from that one uh, it, it's it's very difficult um, knowledge management again uh, trying to ensure that everybody has access to the various uh, uh, assets that we've got or that we paid for under our technical assistance uh, programs. Uh, data analysis, reporting, and performance measurement. Again, work in progress on a lot of these things. We have a lot of information with respect to, you know, uh, how the money gets spent, but exactly what we get at the end of the day, it, it's, a, it's a tough nut to crack for us. Uh, and it, I will pay the dollar to anybody. You can tell me what the HOSDA is, as long as I'm not a good person. Um, that is the Native American Housing and Self-Determination Act. Uh, so we support uh, a, a number of different activities in support of our Indian uh, block grant program and Indian housing programs across the country. So there's a number of different things that we're doing under, under the Community Compass umbrella. As we think about the kind of funding we've had available for this, it's been sliding downward a bit uh, over uh, over the last six, seven, eight years. Uh, high of uh, about 48 million in 2010. We're down to 25 million in FY16. Uh, we await to see what we get in FY uh, 2017. Uh, just as we await uh, a full year appropriation for the bar various programs that we administer. Um, but also there you can kind of see in the funding detail column uh, this sort of uh, slow evolution from, um, uh, from our one CPD approach into the community compass approach, approach and how we kind of consolidated those steps. Question? So what factors are included in the universe of de deciding how to prioritize your visits? Like, do you include single audit results? Is it tied at all to ERM? Or is it just kind of at people's gut feel? Um, we're relying more on our field staff who are our contacts with, uh, with those grantees. And, and maybe it's worth the, worth the effort to just talk a little bit about HUD's field structure. So, um, and I'll talk about it from the CPD perspective because, again, that's, that's the one I'm most familiar with. We have uh, within CPD approximately 730 employees nationwide, uh, about 200 plus, a little more than 200 here in Washington, uh, with the vast bulk, bulk, bulk of our, our staff in the field, split among 43 field offices. They are the day in, day out, uh, frontline contact with the grantees that we serve. And they are working with them and evaluating their annual uh, what are in effect their annual applications for their funding. Uh, they are the ones doing the uh, review of their plans. They're, they're the ones who undertake the monitoring. They're the ones who have that immediate knowledge with respect to what the grantees are doing and where the problems might be. So they're an important piece of this interface and in understanding exactly how, how we're going to deliver this and identify problems. So particularly as part of their monitoring efforts, you know, <coughs> the idea of you go out there and determine well, on a block grant program, you know, after the fact. You make the grant up front, then you go check and make sure that they've done what they said they were going to do with the dollars, and did they do it in compliance with all the requirements. At least that's how the CDBG program works. It's a, it's a default to assuming that the, that the state or local government is going to do what they're supposed to do. So you don't have any centralized capacity to 
like look at other data sources, like pull in, say, single audit from the clearinghouse or other things that just completely, the field just ships up what they think? No, not necessarily. I mean, again, you've got, we have systems internally that, that uh, track all the various findings and concerns that are issued as a result of our monitoring efforts. It, that's the, the regular oversight of the programs. We have the inspector general input. Uh, you certainly have uh, input of, of issues that come to us uh, via, via the media, via the Hill, via other sources that we can act on. Um, the Single Audit Act piece is a, is a part of the, the monitoring process, frankly. I mean, you're, you're checking whether or not, in fact, that, that the grantee's done the things, has filed their reports in a timely way, and, and, and how those Single Audit Act uh, uh, issues and findings might interact with the various programs that we administer. So it is incorporated, but I wouldn't say it's a, a top tier concern for us. I'd like to ask a very superficial question. I see the pattern, 48 million, 25 million. That's a 50% reduction. In theory, technical assistance is supposed to help make sure that your grantees do a good job. Housing the homeless, improving communities. If I were a member of Congress with a superficial sort of attention span, I might ask, have we gotten anything less, or are we actually getting as good or better a set of outcomes with housing the homeless, despite having cut your technical assistance budget in half? Um, difficult question. Um, what we do is we think, uh, uh, first off, in the, in the same window, the funding for the programs has declined uh, over time. So for CDBG, it's a 25% reduction against 2010, so we're down. Uh, the home program is a 50% cut. The homeless programs are up a little bit. Like, again, just talking it generally in the uh, CPD world. Um, so you know, the programs have shrunk, but our grantee base hasn't shrunk. That's kind of a, a, a push-pull uh, under, under some of the formula programs that we operate. Um, I would say this is one of these sort of negotiable pieces of the budget ultimately. Um, you know, we, you, is, it, is it absolutely critical? We'd like to believe that it has a, a tremendous value, but at the end of the day, when there are pushes in, in, the, in, the, you know, in, the, in the appropriation process, what, what's going to take precedence? And it, it's hard to kind of determine that. Uh, now Stephanie had, had a point point you wanted to make? Or? Yeah, th this chart represents the departmental community compass money, uh, but there are, to, to someone's point earlier, there are separately appropriated uh, TA line items that are also awarded through the same NOFA. Uh, homeless funding, as an example, is not actually listed here. So this is just that aggregated, uh, truly meant to be place-based, cross-cutting uh, TA representation. So the special needs assistance programs is not represented here for their TA allotment. That answer. <coughs> you, there seems to be a strong reliance on contractors or providers to provide training and technical assistance. Can you talk a little bit more how you assess their qualifications? Do these people have degrees in urban planning? Do they have experience in working in state and local government? Um, we, how do you go about that? So the question is how do we evaluate uh, the qualifications of, of our TA providers? And so our TA providers are a collection of for-profit entities, non-profit entities, uh, some educational institutions, things of that nature. So it, it's, a, it's a, a collection of, of different entities. And uh, the, the notice of funding availability kind of sets forth what we're looking for and sets the criteria that we expect them to respond to. So clearly as part of that process, they're identifying who their teams are. What is their experience relevant to the programs that we administer? And so we're getting all that information in uh, as part of the application process, the competitive process, when we select these providers. But again, given the range of programs the department runs, it's, it, there's no single uh, uh, profile for a provider, if you will. There are a number of niche players out there that, uh, uh, you know, have, who focus in on particular programs that the department runs and, and particular sets of uh, grantees that receive the money. So uh, it, you have those, 
plus then you have some fairly general providers who you can kind of cut across a number of different issues. And, and so, just to follow up a question with that, that's a contract um, by HUD, correct? We do this under a cooperative agreement as opposed to a contract. Okay, that's what you said. Yeah, the notice of funding availability. Um, so, what are the measures generally? I realize it can get very different and very complicated, but in general, what kind of measures are you using to determine um, you know, an efficacious outcome with those cooperative agreements? Yeah, again, we're back to the issue of exactly what do we get at the end of the day? And, and we're having, you know, there's, there's some difficulty in, in understanding exactly what, what the returns are. Uh, we have strong anecdotal evidence that there are, that, uh, if you can call it evidence, uh, that, uh, that there's a return in many cases in the, in the improvement in the operations of the grantee. Uh, but uh, we really have not been able to establish a lot of strong metrics that would allow us to say that this particular uh, intervention was, was, uh, was successful or not. So um, at Ed, when we post our NIAs mm -hmm. in the Federal Register, and I'm sure what most other agencies were required to identify what outcome measures are part of that grant. Is a cooperative agreement different in that regard? It doesn't require that? Or is it just that they're relatively generic when you guys I would say I'm not an expert on, on the structure of those cooperative agreements, but I know, you know if you want to have that discussion with Stephanie, she is the expert with respect to uh, how we how those are uh, put together and exactly what the requirements are. So what are your reporting requirements and at a high level, and how frequently are your recipients or the recipients required to report? The, the, the TA providers. Correct. Um, it is a, a sort of an, a constant and ongoing uh, process because they are continually submitting, uh, you know, uh, uh, invoices to be paid, and in order to be paid, they're going to have to demonstrate exactly what they've done with respect to uh, the assignment that they were given. So that is really the process by which we're going to control uh, and, and, and see exactly what, what took place on the ground. Uh, in some instances, we'll have staff on site as some of these things occur, and in some cases, we won't be the provider will be operating on their own. But nonetheless, uh, uh, control of the payment process at the end of the day is your most effective uh, tool for uh, being able to understand exactly what uh, what, you're, what you're paying for. One of the things REI has done is used analytics to help identify for an agency that will remain nameless, help identify which are the worst 10% of grantee performers that are kind of slowest or achieving kind of the, 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 the fewest or least results. And we've tried to talk the client into kind of saying, okay, well, let's take that bottom 10% and let's do some random assignment of both half technical assistance methods and even of technical assistance providers. And so I guess my question is whether or not does HUD have enough information that you could identify similarly kind of the bottom performers amongst the housing authorities? And then kind of do you have the ability to say with your technical assistance providers, you know, are they just focused on one geography or could you do some random assignment of TA providers to kind of figure out which ones or which techniques work best? With the uh, allowance that I'm not ex uh, not an expert on our public housing agencies, uh, and uh, I know that our PIH colleagues do have a you know a number of different tools that they can use to assess performance, uh, particularly you know, looking at things like voucher utilization rates. Um, and so those tools exist uh, across the department in various you know uh, various cylinders in in uh, community planning and development we're, we're clearly looking at on the cbg programs and kind of expenditure data to see that they're in fact keeping uh keeping pace with uh, uh their program for our home program there are various commitment and expenditure deadlines imposed by statute uh so there are, are a number of different tools we can look at uh and uh and uh, various flags in our, our data and financial system uh, that allow us to kind of keep tabs on exactly how the grantees are doing and using the tools that we have available it's pretty easy to understand who the uh, uh, who the good performers are let's look at it from that perspective and, and who doesn't make that cut and do you ever say okay let's assign this ta provider to that problem child because they're having a particular kind of problem uh, that's part of the the give and take when we decide who to assign to a particular job 
Um, and so we'll, we're going to look down our list of providers and ask ourselves who's a good fit, kind of regionally, uh, who has expertise in that area. You know, again, a number of different considerations that go into that. Um, you, you have to also balance out the fact you've got this whole roster of providers. You just can't keep turning to the same folks time and time again. Um, let me, I think we're kind of running short on time at this point. Five minutes. Okay. Let me just talk a little bit about one sort of unique um, uh, instance of technical assistance that, uh, that occurred over the last several years. So the department in 2014 announced the National Disaster Resilience Competition. This was a, a $1 billion competition uh, that was uh, to assist states and local governments that had been affected by uh, major declared disasters between 2011 and 2013. Uh, this money was appropriated in 2013 as part of the response to Hurricane Sandy. And ultimately we decided that uh, it might be best to uh, uh, allocate on a uh, competitive basis as opposed to uh, a formula basis, uh, given that the time that had elapsed between some of the, uh, the disasters that were covered under this particular uh, time frame. Uh, we limited the number of applicants to 67. Uh, it was uh, uh, all the states save uh, South Carolina and Nevada because they did not have a major disaster declared in their states in that window. And then there were a number of local governments that uh, we had allocated disaster recovery money to as well in that window, and so we made them eligible <coughs> to apply as well. So it's a total of 67 eligible applicants that we ultimately made 13 grants uh, uh, to that collection. Uh, we were very fortunate in having the Rockefeller Foundation uh, fund a parallel technical assistance effort uh, for all the applicants. Um, they brought to bear uh, a lot of very strong and unusual resources that uh, our grantees would not normally interact with. Um, focused again on post-disaster resilience needs because that was the test here, the idea of uh, you, know, you should still have unmet needs as a result of the disaster that allows you to get into this pool. Uh, and uh, the question will be, how will you rebuild to address uh, your unmet needs as well as be more resilient in the future uh, in response to a similar event? Uh, takeaways from that particular uh, uh, effort, uh, these resilience academies that uh, Rockefeller funded. Uh, these were conducted, uh, it was a two-phase competition, uh, and Rockefeller did a, a academies on both sides of the, of the competition, and these things were really well received by the uh, grantees who attended that, uh, again, thinking about the level of expertise that they brought to, brought to bear uh, was, uh, was uh, exceptional. And uh, it really, um, really got the attention of the grantees. Even those who were, in some cases, unsuccessful ultimately in receiving an award, noted that uh, the the uh, uh, the input that they received really kind of changed their thinking on, on a number of, of different resilience issues. And as we go forward, we're considering how best to uh, uh, continue this effort uh, on on resilience as part of our overall disaster recovery uh, portfolio. So again, this was kind of a, a unique effort, but again, it kind of points out that if you give some, if you give a grantee something that they really want or that they really need, they're going to show up and they're going to be responsive uh, to what you're saying. We get back to this issue of trying to impose uh, a TA provider on them to, to to change underlying policies, processes, procedures. You can get some resistance sometimes, but when you offer them something that is attractive and different, something something they haven't seen before. <coughs> They're going to be very, very receptive to that, uh, to that effort. One of the things the department's doing is uh, uh, moving more and more to a place-based uh, uh, effort and, and incorporating place-based uh, concepts into our overall work. Um, and uh, the idea is to uh, provide a, a sort of that single stop person and, and entity uh, to make sure that a grantee effectively is integrating the various funding streams that are coming to them, not only from HUD, but other federal agencies. Um, the department uh, actively participated in a number of different initiatives under the prior administration. We had the uh, Strong City, Strong Community Initiative and the, uh, and the Promise Zone Initiative. Um, and so that kind of 
that experience kind of sets the stage for some of the things going forward within HUD. Um, there was a lot of effort within HUD in 2016 to internalize and uh, uh, the place-based effort and to begin to embed that via you know, uh, uh, placing certain criteria and in, in, uh, in annual performance plans for, for employees. And so uh, we're going to continue this effort to integrate the uh, uh, place space into our day-to-day -day work, and we need to link these TA efforts up that we have uh, in, a, in a more effective way, or in an effective way, to these uh, uh, <coughs> place space uh, uh, efforts. As we um, kind of think about what's going to come next on this front, we're kind of awaiting uh, additional uh, uh, direction as uh, the department's uh, secretarial nominee, uh, Dr. Ben Carson, has not yet been confirmed by the Senate. Uh, I would suspect that uh, uh, <coughs> might happen next week when, when it comes and returns, but uh, uh, we'll have to wait and see exactly how that, that turns out. But again, we, we need some additional direction to see exactly how we're going to go forward on this particular concept. And with that, uh, uh, Happy to take any additional questions or uh, uh, turn it back over to, to Jeff or Cass. I just have one question. So when um, we're just um, looking at the, the disaster recovery um, uh, grant program, so how do you work with FEMA when they also provide grants from their agency? So what kind of <coughs> feedback or collection mechanism that you tap into for finding out the money is connected? Um, you know, appropriately assigned to these uh, individuals or public assistance. FEMA and HUD work uh, together in, in the disaster recovery scenario. Uh, FEMA certainly is going to be your, your first responder and your, your immediate responder. Yeah. And they're going to get out there, they're going to very quickly deal with homeowners whose property has been damaged, cut checks uh, up to a certain amount, I think $33,000 at the max. Uh, they're going to provide funding ultimately in the longer term with regard to. Uh, public assistance as far as infrastructure repair is concerned, uh, and, and those are our standing programs uh, that FEMA runs. Um, when, when HUD gets involved through our CDG disaster recovery efforts because Congress has deemed that the event is pretty significant and there needs to be an additional incre increment of money over and above what FEMA is going to provide. And so uh, when that occurs, you know, the, the requirements uh, applicable to that money are in effect the CDBG requirements. And, and CBG and, and, and FEMA requirements don't always mesh well. Uh, it's a it's a government wide problem. We have to, you know, have a, a good long hard look at things like the Stafford Act and that, you know, with regard to exactly how these programs operate and then how they interact. Uh, we have multiple federal funding streams out there from FEMA, the SBA has its disaster loan programs. Um, you know, other agencies have other small pots of disaster response and recovery money. Uh, so we really need to have a, a, a better coordinated effort, you know, to uh, and make sure that these, these dollars are used effectively. Um, but uh, when we go out there and provide this technical assistance in support of our DR dollars, it's really about how best to make use of these dollars. Uh, we do talk effectively about uh, the use of these dollars to support uh, FEMA uh, investments. Again, FEMA's going to pay 75 percent baseline you know, replacement on uh, on uh, on infrastructure and it still leaves a local or state match of you know, 25 percent cdbg dollars can be used as local or state match against the fema money it's a unique aspect of the program um so we we try to make sure that they understand how they can use uh, cdbg dollars in that context how they can use CBG funding to make a, a, a particular investment more resilient. Again, if FEMA's not going to pay to put it back the way it was, you need additional money to do what you've got and, and make it more resilient in the future. And so, uh, again, we're, we're talking to grantees about things like that, about how they can more effectively use the dollars that are coming down this way in conjunction with, with uh, other federal dollars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stan. It was great. I learned a lot. both in person and online, and I'll see you at the next breakfast. Thank you. <laughs>